you know, you can't play with fire unless you have permission. If the kid's climbing a tree, they know they have to, as high as they go, they have to be able to get themselves down. Like no one's going to come up there and save them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, right. in that sense, they're able to take that risk where in an, and, you know, like usually kids aren't allowed to climb trees in, in right. a lot of, but then they also, we don't follow them around at, while well, they are during their breaks. You know, there's adults do not have eyes where the kids are. And so that like allows for a certain amount of risk. I mean, that in and of itself to some people is a huge risk for children. Right. Just to not have adults watching at all times. I would say the four and five year olds, our eyes are maybe a little bit more tuned in, but not (laughs) much less than what some people would feel comfortable with. So I think in that social um, interactive play that the kids are allowed to experience and be in situations with one another that might, they might not have that opportunity in another setting. Mm -hmm. This is the Agentic Schools podcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. I'm your host, Don Berg. Hello and welcome to the Agentic Schools podcast. I'm here with Amy Wentworth of The School Around Us and Erin Del Maine. Um, welcome, Amy. Thank you. And so, yeah, um, I like to start off with uh, storytelling. So tell me a story about a student or a family that really um, took advantage of, of what you have to offer, really got great value out of what your school um, uh, does. Mm. let's see there's so many i've been there i've been teaching there for 25 years so um Mm. trying to recall like one that might stick out um i think that there's one that just came to mind that um, I'm not sure if it's the best example, but we had a student um, that came to us when they were in middle, like middle school age, and um, they were really struggling in their other schooling place. And just what we had to offer them was. Um, It was just like one of those situations where you see a a student that's kind of shut down. And then when they are in the right environment, they completely blossom and open up and become a leader. And this, and this student um, was really trying to figure out its sexuality and like where they were um, in the continuum. And then also they were an incredible artist and an activist. And so in their school, they felt before that they just weren't able to be any of that. And then in our, mm-hmm. in our setting, this student just really became like a, a leader and their artistic abilities just blossomed. And then they were able to explore kind of that sexuality spectrum of like first, you know, like the they were a girl and then it became like a they and then it was a he and this person went through all of that and it was so well supported and just them being able to Mm. be truly who they were um it was it was a wonderful just experience of watching an individual find their way as a young person in this world that's so challenging as it is and then in this environment really of our school just being so well supported by their peers and staff and just so that's something that just like stands out um i guess in this in this moment there's many many more yeah oh i'm sure yeah yeah Yeah, it's really um 
an important part of, of looking at schools um, that I consider, you know, agentic, that's why you're here, um, is that there's, there's really a, an emphasis on that support um, and, and really providing a way for that support to be uh, um, provided, you know, like uh, holistically to, to really accept a person for who they are um, in, in every way that they, you know, are showing up. Um, yes. So, so what are some of the ways that your school um, structures that social interaction, that social uh, setting um, mm. for, for, you know, making decisions, resolving conflicts and, 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 you know, supporting people to be more of who they are, not putting yeah. on airs or, or facades. Right. I mean, I think that a school around us kind of the key beginning places in our relationships with one another and that we um, really trust all of the people that are in our system to be learning, to be who they are, so that it, it, it sets an environment where that's the focal point of us having really positive relationships with one another and mm -hmm. allowing for us to be able to express um, who, we, who we are or trying to discover that and, and that that is such a, a, it's at the heart of what we do. So I think that as kids come mm -hmm. to our school, they might have to shed some of the things, the preconceived things of what school is, and it might take them mm -hmm. a while to kind of find their way. But they, I, I just see kids over and over just learning that sense of like, oh, wow, I'm, a, I'm allowed to be that part of myself here. And that part becomes mm. respected. There might be like initial kind of like, well, oh, I don't really know how to be with this person. But after a while, it it's like people just figure out how to accept one another. So I'm not sure if I'm speaking specifically enough, but I think we part of um, part of what we do is starting every day together, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the kids also. We have a, a school meeting we run. It's a democratic school. So we have a meeting every mm -hmm. week. And in that time, um, the kids are part of creating the agreements of how we're going to be together in the space. If issues come up that are maybe um, either the staff sees or other students, they can bring them to the agenda and we we work together to kind of establish the norms and i think that is really empowering for the kids it's hard work and sometimes they don't really like it because it takes a long time mm -hmm. you know to come to agreements or they have to maybe um sit through things that are uncomfortable and that they might have to own um a rule that they broke and, you know, with the community that they might have to be like, yuck, I don't really like it. So it's a little uncomfortable at times, but ultimately in the end, it they feel that empowerment. Um, and I think this yeah. coming back to of like, look, we, you know, kindness and being supportive of one another is at the heart of what we do. And we need to make sure yeah. we keep going up in that way. And we work. So is that kind of answering your question? I feel like I got a little sidetracked. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so um, do you use the meeting as also a forum for conflict resolution, or are those two separate processes? Um, they're two separate. I think if conflicts mm -hmm. that might come up might initially start, maybe be brought there. Um, I think in our, our, mm -hmm. our the way that we solve conflicts, um, we completely trust the kids. We have long breaks, which we call exploration because we really believe that as much learning happens when they're just in play together. And we mm -hmm. trust that they're gonna kind of on that first level, like work out conflicts that come up um, just on their own. And often that mm -hmm. happens and the older kids might help the youngers, you know, you know kind of 
facilitate and figure out. And then there's times where it's just too much for them to handle. And so they come and they might seek adult support. And then we might just through modeling, like good listening and supporting one another, just mm -hmm. solve the conflict more or less right in that moment through, um, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. conversations and really having the kids just take the time to listen to one another. Um, but we do have a more formal um, process that if something that came up that broke one of our safety rules where either mm -hmm. something physical um, happened or maybe verbally kind of abusive situation, um, we have, which it, it, we call it a justice circle. And I think a lot of schools use them. Mm. Um, and it's a pretty, but we found that it, it works really nicely and that you know, it's that circle where the first round is just everybody kind of stating the facts of what they saw. And then mm. the next round is like the feeling of like, how did it feel for each perspective? And then like, what do people need? And then, you mm. know, setting a goal of like, when are we going to come back? And now that we have a resolution of how, this, when are we going to come back and check in and see like, how's it going? Mm -hmm. And that, um, Right we we adopted that a few years ago. Um, we had like a conflict resolution that didn't wasn't quite as I would say formal as that. What I really like about this one is that it mm -hmm. it's um it kind of separates a little bit from the emotion at first, where we're just kind of stating the facts, and that kind of helps everybody mm -hmm. a little bit of ease of like oh okay, and then when we do that round of people really talking about their feelings, it's pretty amazing what kids what I mm. witnessed kids being able to share and support and the way they support one another and then owning their perspective of like ooh that was not really a good choice um mm -hmm. yeah I just I don't know I find it to be I I wish that more people <laughs> had those skills you know and had the time like, yeah just, yeah yeah you know like really just go through that process because it's so valuable um for just our right. sorry my dog is like in the background um, <laughs> um yeah so i think yeah. that that's fascinating so, so so let's um uh orient people a little more just to the the mundane details sort of age range and what community you're in and and things like that yeah so um, our school is four to 14 year olds. Um, and okay. we have four basic groups where our four and five year olds, we call them spirals. Our four and five year olds are in a spiral together. Then our six to eight year olds, and then our nine to 10, 11 year olds, and then our 11 to 14 year olds. Um, we do a lot together. We start our day together. Um, there are classes that they can take together, um, throughout the day, you know, the school's going into its, um, 53rd year. And for mm, 50 nice. those years, we were an actual school and we, that was a parent run school, which I could go mm. on and on about, but we no longer are a parent run school and we're <laughs> not a school anymore. We transitioned to a co-learn oh. homeschool community. Um, three years ago. Okay. So mm -hmm. all the students that are with us now are registered with the state as homeschoolers, but we do have a full-time program that runs very, a lot like if you had come to school around us 10 years ago and you come now, you would see a lot of similarities in the way that we run. Um, mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, the big difference is, is that everyone is registered as a homeschooler and we have a part-time program right. where some kids come just twice a week. Um, and those are consistent mm -hmm. days, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. No, Tuesday and Wednesday, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, and we have four, four full-time staff members and two part-time um, teachers. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. Very cool. And, and it's interesting because you, you know, one of the things I like to ask people about Pardon me. <clears throat> are are kind of their relations to the the wider world, um, mm -hmm. 
And, and so it sounds like you guys have made a transition in the last few years um, mm -hmm. from, from a long history of operating in a certain way, but mm -hmm. shifting, shifting in a way that, that doesn't sound like it's really a big shift for the experience students are having, but a shift in how you're uh, sh labeling yourself or how you're, you're holding uh, relationships with kind of the world be, you know, outside. Um, so, so it's interesting to me, you know, thinking about those bigger relationships. Um, are, are there things that, like, what, what would you say are the contributors to that? Were there, con was it just pandemic related or was it uh, concerns about how the <clears throat> regulatory environment is or what were, what kind of, and, and and is it a settled issue? Is it, you know, are there still concerns that might uh, bring more dynamic? So so, tell yeah. me more about that. Yeah. So it was there was multiple reasons why we transitioned. I think one, okay. the parent run component. Um, I, I mean, I've been involved in the school for twenty five years, and so the watching us go through the transition of from parent run, where they really ran the school they were everything we did all of it mm. and we we just okay. had this ongoing and we ran um by consensus was our process of democracy and so okay. it was pretty incredible that the school still exists to be honest because <laughs> 25 adults that have other jobs and then they come together right. and they try to run a school I mean, they were the bookkeepers, they were the cleaners, they were the fixers, they were the, you know, oversaw the staff, everything, everything that run, you need to make a school run, they did by mm -hmm. volunteer. And then they had to make all the decisions by consensus. So it's pretty incredible that the wow. school um, has lasted. But one thing that come up, came up over and over and over is just parent burnout. By the time they... Mm done with their nine years at the school or if they la if they lasted that long they were w worn out by the process mm. and because they had to run the school their amount of you know time to be actually involved with the education and their students learning mm. was small. so we uh, you know being somebody there that was kind of consistent through that process they we just kept looking for ways to be more efficient or should we do a director run school mm -hmm. and that there was a lot of resistance for a long time for that and mm. over time we we switched from consensus to consent which is i don't know how much mm. you know of the two models but it's they're similar that was one big shift mm. and then we decided um before the pandemic hit that like maybe we should think about a director run school and see what that mm. would be. Then mm. with, mm. with the onset of the pandemic, it put us into reflective mode even further. And there were other small schools opening up right. um, near us. That, so that was competition. And then also the state of Maine passed the vaccination law. Um, that every student would have to be vaccinated and half of our families, um, if we were a school, would not be able to attend. And we were like, okay, mm -hmm. we have a competition, we have this new law that isn't meeting our needs right. of our family. And then homeschooling was getting larger and larger in the state of Maine. And right. so it kind of, like, oh, there was a wide variety of factors. And so we, mm -hmm make the switch to a homeschool community and interestingly enough being mm -hmm. part of that process um where we're director run now and um we're still mm -hmm. in the governance restructuring of like how do we keep the essence uh, of what the consensus model was where everybody mm -hmm. has a voice i mean that is something that's like the heart of our school is that each person here no matter how old you are has a voice that has value and needs to be heard and be part of what we do. And that's mm -hmm. that core value. When the school started in 1970, it was a free school. And then it shifted from that right. probably within five years of the history to 
a school that wasn't a preschool, but it was still a holistic learning environment. And then it's had many iterations. And so now it's like, um, yeah, the governance structure for the adults in the system, it's, we're trying to figure out how to bring the parent voice in, not in the way that it was before, because we found that that was exhausting for them. And then, right. um, but, and then, so then the staff, like hierarchies happen naturally, but we have right now like circles of leadership and how do we share mm -hmm. decisions among them where do we have autonomy within our circles and I would say our educators we have a lot of autonomy to work with the students to develop the curriculum that mm -hmm. we have you know the our director um, kind of holds the space but doesn't really have a lot of say of like oh no you can't do that or yes you can or whatever we we're pretty free right. <laughs> you know to like to do what we feel is best for the students that are in our school. Uh -huh. um, right, right. So I don't know if you have other. Yeah, that's interesting because that. Yeah, that's really you know that that's exactly the the challenge is that there's, um, the, the the type of school that emphasizes agency. One the especially the ones I've started talking to. Um, in the democratic school environments and 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 holistic areas, um, they're the the one of the ways they distinguish themselves from schools that I've delayed contacting um, mm -hmm. is that they've made agency central to everyone in the environment. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's interesting, you know, you've gone through some of the really interesting ways of organizing that uh, mm -hmm. that process is. Yes, we need agency, but we also can't burn parents out. You know, you, you have to have agency, but there's there's ways that you have to operate and, and, and figure out how to operate. And so you've gone through the challenges and discovered, okay, that's, you know, we did that for a while. Now we're trying something different because it didn't feel like it was really working. Uh, mm -hmm. or, or the situation outside of us changed, and maybe it was working, but something else changed, and we don't mm -hmm. think it's going to continue to work. What, but that, that flexibility, that ability to respond to the needs in the environment, the needs within and out, from outside, I mean, is I think a really important part of of recognizing what agency means, because it doesn't just mean in the old freedom, free school, as in freedom, like mindset was, just let them do anything, uh, right. which wasn't really what went on, but that's the perception mm -hmm. of it. And that's sometimes mm -hmm. some of the people in that time talked about it that way, which was probably yeah. not helpful. Um, mm -hmm. But, but that, sense that freedom means an individual freedom or an individual but but there's a larger picture is and this is you know from my perspective as someone who studies psychology mm. is that there's there's a sort of implicit uh assumption that psychology is about one person's mind mm -hmm. and it's not <laughs> because right. what we've discovered in psychology is you can't separate you, you can't talk about the the brain or you know a mind in a brain without talking about the other minds the other brains involved in how that situation is occurring right and so it's kind of an interesting uh, you know and, and that's where i see some of the rhetoric around free schools can mm. be problematic in a variety mm. of ways uh, one of the ways is just from understanding what's happening psychologically it's like well mm. It's not the way people think it is. <laughs> um, right. But then it also shows up in these really interesting organizational ways, is mm -hmm. that you're, you're realizing that there's an impact on parents that's not really serving them, and it may not be serving the community as well as it could, and so you're going to tweak. You're going to go from consensus to consent. Um, you're going to go from, you know, and, and then, you're, and then you ha even have other minds beyond your school in terms of a legislature that says, yeah. now we're right. going to do something else here. Um, yeah. And then you have to say, okay, those brains are influencing us now too. <laughs> and and how do we respond to that? Um, and, and so you make decisions. But that's the thing that really, I think is really important to understand when we talk about agency in English, when you talk about an agent, there's two yeah. different meanings of that. One, there's the person making the, taking action, 
doing something. But there's mm-hmm. also the representative of something. You know, we talk about an insurance agent. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so you have both of those meanings in English. It's really, I, I think it, part of the reason I really in, like that term is because it has both of those meanings. Um, mm. And I understand actually from a, some friends that in other languages it may not have that meaning. But, but right. for us, it's really, you know, agency has both, yes, my agency, but my agency is also shaped by how I'm representing something bigger. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. So, so, so that's where, um, that's why it's so important to emphasize decision making and conflict resolution is because that's where those two things intersect. Um, yeah. You know, one, one of the things, the other things about the free schools, and, mm-hmm. and the idea that people are free, is that is that there are things that the kids must do. Right. And, and they are not free to hurt others. You know, they're not free. And, and so, so that, and, but that's the thing that is like, if, if you, our language could be better around understanding how embedded the children are in something mm. uh, bigger um, right. and, and emphasizing that as opposed to merely the individual sense of freedom, which is true. Um, mm-hmm. But it's a sense of freedom that occurs within sort of a, an important structure. And that, that's what those questions are about is what does mm-hmm. that structuring look like? Um, and and it, it gets to some of the mythologies in our society about mm-hmm. that. And, and I, that, that's the next, I guess, the next question for you is, is there are some ways that people tend to misunderstand either just you as a school, but also just mm-hmm. have sort of these predominant myths from the mainstream of education. What are some of the myths that you've run into uh, from parents in particular um, that, mm-hmm. that sort of inter- interfere with their ability to, to either choose your school or to understand how you operate? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, a lot, I think people come with the, the paradigm of like, my kid needs to be able to read and write and do math and of experience in science and history in order to make it in the world. Like they won't go to college if they are not top of their class in those academic areas and they're not gonna make it. And that that is such a paradigm pressure that I think people, Mm. when they choose our school are trying to get away from that and they they understand of that whole person and they love the idea that like we spend it to us having relationships, being able to solve problems, be able to um, tie your own shoe, clean up after yourself, be part of a community, work with other people. Um, mm-hmm. Those things of being human, be, you know, understand yourself, like your identity and your your, the spirit of who you are is like central to what we're trying mm-hmm. to do. Um, there are times where people, oh, that's so great that you do that, but why isn't my kid reading? Kind of feeling. Like, <laughs> why do you let them play for so long? When when are they mm-hmm. when are they reading? You know, so it always kind of comes back to those academic pieces that they worry about that. And I think Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is since we've been a homeschool community for the last three years, just seeing the difference. One, I think families that decide to homeschool their children, even if they send them to us, they've already started that paradigm shift in themselves Mm -hmm. of, I trust that my kid is going to learn. I just, they, so Mm -hmm. we have less of that now than we did in the past where there was a lot more questioning about Mm. the way that we went around the academic components of what we did, why we would, why we would spend an hour trying to problem solve something like this. Can't you just get on with it? Like, can't you just leave that alone and move on to, (laughs) you know, the next thing or like, um, so I think it's, I think it's some of those societal pressures. That's what I see is people sometimes can't overcome that. And so they might leave 
mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. the fear, when they're like having a tour of our school or reading things on our website, they might be intrigued enough to come and visit. But then when they actually think about making that shift, they just might not be ready, have enough confidence mm-hmm. that or trust in the process of learning that their kid is going to, you know, like is, is going to figure it out along the way and that mm. they might not, but eventually they will. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so I, that's what I see is most of the time. It's not that, um, uh, they're leaving because we spent too long in math class and their kids know too much math. It's like it's <laughs> right. enough time there, you know, and like, um, it's harder for them to find that appreciation in some of the social emotional mm. um, components that we really work to do um, right. with the kids. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that I was thinking about when with the, I don't know if you have another question for me, but oh no, go ahead. Um, oh well, just the I whole mean, eventually, like, yes, but <laughs> yeah, but just. The whole like opt in concept. Um, mm, that's yes, something yes. we definitely have. You know, there's one other woman that's worked at the school with me for almost as long. We've been together and we've gone back and forth over the years of this opt in, opt out kind of um, mm. classroom structure. And, you know, I think it's something that we're still like working to try to find that um, the, what the, the sweet spot, but mm-hmm. what we are as a community, where um, you can't opt out. So what we do is we work with the kids to help them learn to um, shift an educational experience or a class that meets their learning style. Like no we're in math class, Mm. this is what we're doing. So how can we structure it or tailor the experience to reflect you as a learner? So you can't opt out Mm -hmm. because this is something that we've all agreed that we have value, that we value. But Uh, you, you do have the right as a learner to work with the educator the class to Mm -hmm. shift the experience um, so that they find success and they gain, you know, they have a positive experience, you know, I, and I, Mm -hmm. and I don't always, um, I think that some of the learning that happens is maybe not math, but them figuring out, Mm how do I engage with this group of people? How do I be a good participant in a classroom structure um, as a team member? So may, they may not be learning the history class or whatever topic we might be on, but what they are figuring out right. is how do, I, how do I participate with this community and be a productive, positive member as an individual? And we've had experiences, we've had classes where kids can opt out. And what we've found over time, and we haven't like, I've not been at the school when it was a free school, where in that structure, teachers that I've spoken to, eventually kids opt in because we're naturally, I mean, we're wired to be, we're curious. We want to know, we want to learn, we want to expand it. And we want to be part of systems that are, you know, with other humans. So eventually they'll leave right. whatever experience, one thing and, and join another. And I believe that that is true. Mm-hmm. But I also notice that, that when that option is there, they will opt out because they might have a worry or a fear or no, it's new. I, no, I'm not going to try it. I don't want to, I'm not going to experience that. Yeah. And so 
that's something that my colleague and I talk a lot about of like how many kids have actually expanded and really grown because they were asked to opt in and Mm -hmm. knowing that they are able to enter at their rate, at their pace, what's comfortable with opting in. Does that make sense with like the difference? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, um, there, there's some interesting research on, uh, in, in psychology that looks at commitment devices, you could say. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, you know, when, when you, when a person gets into a situation and they have to make a choice and they, you know, like if, if they, if they can choose A or B and then that's it, they have no choice. They, they, they are stuck with that choice thereafter versus right. I can choose this. But then at a certain point, I can change my mind and choose the other one instead uh-huh. is, you know, people vary in how they respond to those things. But on mm-hmm. the whole, most people are happier when they've made a choice and did not have the ability to change it later. So uh-huh. they're actually more satisfied with the result when they don't have the option to switch. So it's mm-hmm. like the opt out you're saying. Right. where you're saying you've chosen this class and then you can opt out later again. But mm. what happens is by by understanding this situation as one in which I made a choice to participate in this and now I'm committed to it, mm. and then they will make the, the, the explanation is, now I will make the best of it. I will right. justify in my mind that this is the best choice for me mm. um, regardless of other factors. And And I think that also the the kind of community that you're talking about is also one in which they didn't have to make a choice within an impersonal bureaucracy. They Mm. made a choice within a community of people who have together made decisions. Like you said, Mm -hmm. we made this decision that this is important. And so it's a question of how are you going to participate, not whether you will participate. And so what you've done is created a a community that is built on a trusting relationship of, yeah, you're here, here, and you're going to learn this, but we're going to be responsive to your needs. We're not simply yeah. going to say you have to do this. And the teacher is, you know, <clears throat> all powerful. Right. We're saying you come right. into the situation and you're a participant in how it occurs, how it happens. Yes. There's mm-hmm. a content and there's stuff mm-hmm. that the teacher has an agenda to get through. But mm-hmm. how that occurs is going to be part of the conversation and part of how we are together. Um, yeah. And I think that's kind of where my work is trying mm. to emphasize that interactivity, the, the, the bigger context around how those decisions were made, how mm. that, uh, what the results of those choices are, and the, the nature of the relation, like the, the distinction between a intimate caring community and an impersonal bureaucracy right. is a huge factor. It makes a difference. Um, that's why most of the schools I'm talking to are small. Right. Um, actually, how, how many students do you have? Um, well, we have 40 in total. Um, that's on our, okay. when we have our part-time days. And mm-hmm. then we, we almost are, I think we're like half that size on our full-time days. So Monday and Thursday, okay. we have 21 in the building. And then, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well, we're, we're outside most of the time, but um, right. then we <laughs> double in size on our, yeah. it's, it's yeah. small. With four, like in my group, I have seven, two days a week. Mm-hmm. And then I have 12 on the other, but then I have an assistant teacher. Yeah. I mean, we're, we feel large. This is the largest we've ever been. We're like, whoa, but oh, right we're small. it's still small. And I think yeah. that that's key. I mean, that's what I wonder. I mean, I think that so many of the public school setting, it, the bureaucracy gets in the way of these intimate communities. But I okay. wonder if like these, if the classes were half the size, if it would feel different or if they had, 12 students, you know, with an assistant, Mm -hmm. would they be able to overcome, you know, some of those, some of the the things? Um, Right. Well, the research on class size says basically no. 
uh, <laughs> class mm -hmm. size is less of a factor than people's sure. intuitions would like to think. Um, yeah. and, and I think that that is also highly dependent on, on bureaucracy, is yeah. that if you were to take the class size down, but then also ensure that that class is embedded in a an administrative structure that's not going to make arbitrary impositions and requirements, mm. it's going to change how it operates. So even, even a larger class is going to be more functional in a human interaction, human relationship sense, if it's not having to respond to arbitrary demands from outside itself. Um, if it's, huh. if it's, you know, if, if, for instance, a teacher is trusted as a real professional who has, you know, professional judgment and professional, you know, uh, skills that need to be honored mm -hmm. like a doctor's professionalism and skills are honored mm -hmm. um then then when they make then then they're free to make those decisions then right. they will operate in a, in a more productive way so i think that that there's a mm -hmm. reason why class size doesn't matter and that is because it's not the class size per se that's the issue mm -hmm. the issue is how is that group of people relating to each other and are they having being forced to respond to things outside of their group that right. are ir that are arbitrary now of course there's always going to be things outside the group that are non-arbitrary like you do have to be safe you do have to be respectful you know <laughs> like some of those things right. are you know yeah that that's societal yeah. expectations are real and important right but right. arbitrary requirements like arbitrary testing or arbitrary mm -hmm. academic Right. standards right. or something like that. Now, mm -hmm. if their consensus, if the, the group chose those standards to be relevant, then mm -hmm. that's fine. So I'm not right. saying standards are bad, but I'm saying that arbitrary standards are bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. so yeah, that's, that's where I, you know, I'm really fine that, that uh, an environment like yours, what you've done is, and you know, the history is a group, a community coming together to, mm -hmm educate children and doing it in a way, I mean, as a parent run operation, it's like you can't get a flatter power structure if the kids are interacting with the people making the decisions, mm. that's as democratic as it can be. Uh, even mm -hmm. if those, you know, parents might, you know, want to do things differently, but, but you've set it up as a, you know, consensus mm -hmm. and consent and, and now a director, but a director whose powers are limited. And, you know, the, our, even the director doesn't get to make arbitrary demands, you know, right. um, but you're, it right. sounds like your community has really protected that mm -hmm. those relational supports and, mm -hmm. and particularly, you know, yes, we're going to appoint a director, but that sounds more like maybe an administrative director, not a curriculum director or a, or, yeah. you know, like not, not a, you know, boss of the building, you know, mm -hmm. boss of the, the mm -hmm. staff, but more of a, like, we, we need to manage the, enrollment and the payroll and the you know mm -hmm. those tasks that yeah mm -hmm. they're I, yeah. I was administrator for a long time so i know they're challenging <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 it's it's so uh, so go ahead no i just like just thinking about like the whole process of trying to change this educational structure that is out there that's so you know, I, I started in the public system, you know, 25 years oh, yeah. ago. Well, well, I was in there for like out of the 30 years of my teaching, I was in the public system for five. And so it was a long time ago. Mm. But, um, so I feel a little bit out of the loop, but just it feels mm. like, wow, is, can we, is it going to change? You know, I don't know. Yeah. It's it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. it, it, it yeah that, that's a lot of what my work has been is is i've been kind of floating between worlds um going to mm. you know main more mainstream conferences just to try and find out what what is going on and there's actually some really great stuff in a variety of places um cool. that's good to hear that 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 are yeah they 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 talk a good game a lot of times like i've been to you know state boards the the conferences for the state boards of education um and, 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 and they have some good things that they're trying to accomplish, but then they're, you know, there's also the, these arbitrary restrictions that legislators impose upon them. Um, and so it's like, uh -huh. in some states, like state boards of education have almost no power um, hmm. because the legislator has put such onerous restrictions on them that, 
you know, you think the State Board of Education must be able to do all kinds of cool stuff, but then if the legislator strips them of the power, then no, they can't. <laughs> um, anyway, let, uh, let's focus on, on your situation. Uh, okay. So, so one of the things that I always find interesting and that, that varies a lot from school to school is that schools where freedom, children are given a lot of freedom, also mm -hmm. means that they oftentimes are enabled to take risks that they may not be able to take in other schools or to explore topics that might be more controversial and less available mm -hmm. in traditional schools. What are mm -hmm. some of the ways that you, you as a school um, facilitate that, manage risk, and ensure that they're, they're still in a safe and you know, appropriate environment? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I guess I think we, we have these key safety rules that like are pretty mm -hmm. well established um, and the kids know them really well. So those I think help mm -hmm. you know, um, can create a container. Like there's very clear boundaries where the kids need permission to be able to go out of bounds, but within those boundaries, mm -hmm. there's a lot of freedom. So um, that's one way there. And then like just verbal and physical safety, um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't play with fire unless you have permission. You know, some of those, I think, help. Um, right. And and then having, you know, just clear conduct agreements that we work to follow. Mm -hmm. So those help kind of create this container for us to be able to feel safe within because when mm -hmm. any of those are violated, there's attention that's given and, and kind of we connected to the understanding of what we've agreed to. Um, mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think that, you know, with the kids climbing a tree, they know they have to, as high as they go, they have to be able to get themselves down. Like no one's going to come up there and save them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, right. in that sense, they're able to take that risk where in an, and so, you know, I guess that comes to mind when people say like, they, you know, like usually kids aren't allowed to climb trees in, uh, in right. a lot of things. Um, but then they also, we don't follow them around at, while they are during their breaks. You know, there's adults do not have eyes where the kids are. And so that like allows for a certain amount of risk. I mean, that in and of itself to some people is a huge risk for children. Right just to not have adults watching um, at all times. I would say the four and five year olds, our eyes are maybe a little bit more tuned in, but um, not <laughs> yeah. much less than what some people would feel comfortable with. So I think in that social um, um, interactive play that the kids are allowed to experience and be in situations with one another that might they might not have that opportunity in another setting mm -hmm. um and around topics of um um that we might discuss as a class or things that might come up i think because the kids have a voice in the curriculum um i think there's freedom for class topics to Mm -hmm. We consent to them to come up that might not happen in another setting. Um, and am I get, is this answering your question? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you so so when you talk about permissions, do you have like some like you, you said about the tree climbing? Like, yes, you can climb the tree, but you have to be able to get yourself down. That's actually literally a rule I had when I was homeschooling other people's kids. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> So is there, is there sort of um, like standing permissions for like that? Like, are there, like some schools have like a certification process or some like a formal way of, of, of acknowledging when somebody is, is, has permission essentially to do something like that. Do you have a, a like written things or is it formalized or is it just, you know? It's more it? just we know the kids pretty well. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's like a few times that a kid might find themselves up in a tree and they can't get out down and they might need 
somebody to talk them through the process. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, like going out of bounds, which we have a brook and, you know, a wooded area that's out of bounds. We allow the kids to go out of bounds on their own when they've, I think it's kind of this um, unspoken yet people like proving yourself as an individual, like I'm ready for this responsibility. And I've Mm. shown in these other ways within the school setting that I really am, I'm ready to take on this responsibility to go out of bounds with a friend of mine. And I'm not going to, just because I'm out of bounds, start swimming in the brook on my own kind of thing. Like they're, they'll stay by the brook's edge and they will do just as they said that they're going to do, that there's a commitment that they have yeah. um, to do that. And then there's times where kids might be a little on the cusp of whether they're able to do something like that. And we might mm-hmm. make a one-time agreement like, all right, I think you're ready to give this a try. And they go and come mm-hmm. back and share, like, how did you do? You know, were you able to mm-hmm. follow with what you said and so there's like a you know a conversation in that way that might be more informal yet formalizing in that moment that ability to go and like you know this one kid i know i know you're ready but this other one i want to see like let's have a little bit more of a conversation and like and then you can be ready too um so there's some of that gray area wobbling i guess i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah, and, um, yeah th- and i think that's also personalization the a positive personalization of of you know like you said you, you can recognize that one's ready that one's not um and 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 be responsive to that without having it be you know uh perceived as unfair or something um th- that's why i think other schools <clears throat> have done a little more formality around it is is that it it sort of ensures that there's a consistency um and and you know they they saw the need for it it doesn't necessarily mean it's it's you know uh necessary all the time um so one of the things that that i find interesting particularly with schools that have a long history like yours is that sometimes there's a very specific jargon or or code words things that that work that developed uniquely in your environment. Are there any um, particular like code words or 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 things ways that you you know unique things to your school that would be really great if other people knew about them or shared them? Huh? Can you give me an example? I'm not quite sure if I know what you mean. So um, at the Whole Life Learning Center, they have this thing where they they make the kind of a for those who are listening a peace sign kind of thing. But what that means is they have love and respect, and they have a whole thing around using that as a as a way to bring their meetings together, or, um, uh-huh. you know, something like that. Or, uh-huh. or at the Village Free School, they had this thing where um, uh, it was their stop rule, and I forget what they hmm. they had. They had a code word that everyone knew that if you said it, then oh, stop seriously. That's what it was. Is that stop seriously by the consensus of the of the of the whole school was mm. you know how so many kids are roughhousing and something and someone says stop but they don't really mean it. Oh well, yeah. Stop seriously became their code word for no you have to stop and if you don't stop I can write you up or you know do more you know bring in more resources to help but you like that. Uh-huh. Well, let's see. I mean, one thing that's kind of become uh, uh, if we, you know, the sign language, the clapping for sign language, which we call it sparkle. Yeah, deaf applause. Yeah. Yeah. So if you yeah, sparkle fingers, if, <laughs> right? If you agree with somebody, you know, we sparkle, and so that's kind of fun. Where if we're in a meeting, you know, you might see all these hands go up and like everybody's sparkling what somebody says, and that's kind of a sweet um, nice. thing. Uh, you know, we have stop means stop. I think we might need stop seriously, but they say stop <laughs> and they still sometimes don't listen when right. stop comes up. So I think that yeah. that was an ongoing discussion. Um, mm-hmm. We used to have like quiet coyote um, was the code mm. word for everybody come together and be quiet. That one, 
um, has waxed and waned a little over the years as far as like how responsive kids are. You know, they start making up like funny things like a oh, quiet llama, you know, and then they're still talking and coming up right. with ideas. <laughs> What does that symbol mean? <laughs> oh, and then they're still right. like, they're not quiet. But um, yeah, I think that's what comes to mind. Um, right on, right on. Yeah, just just so you know, I live on a llama ranch, so that calling that all, the, the llama is really nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we actually need to wrap it up here. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about let's let's end where we began with a story. So tell me a story about um, a particular challenge that either your school or or a particular student faced um, that that then transformed and became something that really helped them or the school to grow and be better. Mm. Well, I I think of this one this one student that. Um, this really had was you could you could tell that like well I mean all of us like in our heart are just pure kindness but he was just overcome with so many like challenges that he found himself in conflict a lot and be mm. we before um, before trying to support him, we didn't have a really good structure in our system mm. that it felt more punitive. And we ended up mm. in our process of trying to support him in our system of creating a, we called it our kindness policy, but a system where in each level he went through, he got more and more support in order to help him thrive. So it wasn't like, and that just, I think, shifted for us this energetic perspective of like, you're a problem. You need to sit with this group of mm. people to talk about what the problem you are. And said it was the shift to all of these people are here to support you to become the best person you can be. And it's a mm. this supportive process. And it's very similar process that you might go through, but the perspective is like, we are all at this table to help you become the best person you can be. And the, the adults that were there, were there in the idea of like, I'm here to help you. And here is the support mm. so you can do this well. And that, um, I don't know, it, like for me, it just, feels really like beautiful and human of, I don't know, like that classic mm -hmm. American um, where they, when someone's depressed, everyone stands around. I don't know which tribe this is and I'm probably getting it wrong. So forgive me, mm -hmm. but, and just really uplifts that person and tells mm -hmm. them all of the things that they the ways in which they really are contributing to the world. And I think so often when people are maybe not contributing in positive ways. They're hit with that negative tip, you know, like you're bad, you're doing this, you, you, you. And just this shift to like, how can we help you shine in this mm -hmm. area of, of your greatness? And that um, I really love, as I think it's really, it, yeah. he, he helped our school develop a policy that really is uplifting people. Um, the students mm. that have had to go through since him. Um, to right on. Right away. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so before we actually turn it, you know, turn it, go on to our lives, um, give the, give our audience um, the information they need to get in touch and find out more. Yeah. So, um, well, we have a website. And it's schoolaroundus.org. And on that site, I think has it's we've been working on really building it up. And so there's there's email addresses um, for each of the staff members if you want to reach any of us personally, um, just or information. 
there's telephone numbers if mm -hmm. you know people want to talk with our director or our enrollment process. Um, I think it's a great resource of finding out more about us. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks yeah. again. Thank you. Okay, so it's...